Hey everybody, welcome to Guided Listening. I'm Jeff Antoniak. Today we're going to be listening to some Horace Silver and his great composition, Strollin', fantastic band, and uh, we're going to dig into that some. Um, I'm going to be doing some traveling coming up, and I hope I'm going to be uh, going somewhere where you may be. In mid-May, uh, I'm going to be with Alan Blackman's incredible quintet, and we're going to be playing in Plattsville, New York, and so we're going to be... Uh, upstate and doing some great concerts there. So if that's your neck of the woods, leave me a message. Let me know where you're at. Later in May, I'm going to be in Minneapolis, St. Paul in the Twin Cities. I'm going to be doing a workshop on Friday, May 31st at Schmidt Music. Uh, the Thursday night, I'm playing at Jazz Central. The Friday night, I'm playing at Crooners. So I've got two incredible gigs and a free workshop sponsored by Eastman Saxophones that I hope you'll be at. In uh, June, I'm going to be up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, right before the International Jazz Festival there, and we're going to be doing the uh, Saxophone and Improvisation Summit. We have some openings. We're booked up for bass already, but we have openings for all other instruments. They're kind of going a little bit quickly, so uh, jump on that if you're interested. You can find the, uh, the website here. And then in July, I'm going to be uh, in the D.C. area with the 21st uh, Summer Summit. So again, we're booked up. I think we have one horn spot left. I think we have one guitar spot and maybe one piano spot left. And then we have a couple bass and drum spots left. The other thing I want to say is we offer scholarships every year. We've been funded to offer four scholarships for a young person, 16 to 21, on bass or drums. So it's a full scholarship, uh, full tuition covered to come to the Summer Summit. And two of those are specifically for young women. The other two are for anybody playing bass and drums. So reach out, go to the website, reach out. And uh, if you know somebody, if you are somebody, let's, uh, let's get you a scholarship. Okay, so let's, uh, let's jump into Stroll in here. This is actually one of the songs we're going to be doing at the D.C., Jazz Wire Summer Summit. We pick 14 songs every year. This is one of the songs. So I've been thinking about it. I've been playing it on gigs a little bit. It's a really great tune. So it features Horace Silver on the piano. Blue Mitchell plays an incredible trumpet solo. Junior Cook on uh, the tenor saxophone. Gene Taylor on bass. Roy Brooks on drums. So some names that we don't hear named all the time, you know, when we talk about the famous, you know, five, ten drummers that we always talk about are bass players. So Gene Taylor, Roy Brooks, we don't talk about so much, but man, playing great here. And one of the things with a Horace Silver recording, a Horace Silver group, it's always so well rehearsed. So, you know, Horace was a real composer, right? And, um, and there were usually specific parts or little moments that the bass and the drums had to catch. This is recorded in 1960. So, you know, lots of the times through the 40s, 50s, 60s, it's like, hey, bass player, here's some chords, walk a bass line. Drummer, it's swing at 130. Go. Play swing, right? Um, so with Horace's compositions, there may be some parts for the two horns. There may be a counter melody or harmony, which we're going to hear. Um, it may be in a two feel moving to a four feel. There's all these possibilities. And then with Horace himself, the way he would comp on his compositions, very often there would be a set comping rhythm. So, so he more than many others had these set parts for the uh, for the non-horn players. Of course, the horn players had a set part. They're playing the melody. That's set. I wrote this song, but all the other stuff underneath with Horace more than many. Let's put it that way. More often than most, he would have kind of written parts, and so that um, makes his music sound different, right? And he had, he had some uh, success. You'd find these things on a jukebox. These, some of his songs would get played on the radio more than others because I think there was an organization to them that a lay person could relate to. Maybe it sounded more like a pop tune, a popular tune, a funk tune, you know, something of that era um, in that it was just a little more, I don't want to say constrained, but organized, well-rehearsed, you know, let's use terms like that. So let's jump into this. Let's listen to Strollin, uh, Horace Silver, and the quintet. This is off the Horace Scope album. So just right there, that bass pickup. Ba-doo-bomb. 
let's stop there. So just that, boo So I don't know if Horace wrote that or if he turned to a gene and said, hey man, play a pickup or like however it happened, we heard it into the first A section and then four measures later, we hear it again. So that's the kind of signature I'm talking about. It's so subtle, it's, it's like barely there but it's there. So let's listen. Um, does it happen twice in every, like how many times does that happen on the melody end? Let's go back. Here's that. There it is again. And now we're in this two feel, right? One, two, bum, dig it down. So the bass is playing half notes, more or less, ornamented half notes. Drums on the, on the hi-hat, kind of opening and closing hi-hat. Second A section, or no, the second half of the tune. It's like an A, B, A, C. Bass, there it is for the fourth time. Still in this nice bouncy two feel. Great feel, great feel. And the harmony between the two horns. It's just two horns, it sounds like a big band. And these little hits there, that the whole rhythm section. That. Ba, da, 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 da. The drummer and the bass player played along with the horns. Composed, rehearsed, arranged. Blue Mitchell. And now, we're walking, right? We're strolling double time. We're on the cymbal now. Listen to Horace's comping. It's a little hard to hear. We'll hear it better behind the tenor solo, I think. Such great lines in what Blue Mitchell's playing. His sound and his time are so great. The way he's articulating, do, do, da, 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 da. so it seems like he's articulating each note, but it's so swinging, and he's often playing quite straight, but it's swinging, straight but swinging. Listen to Horace. Do, da, do, like little bluesy aspects, but he's just hitting the piano with his left hand. Notice that. He's playing these low sounds. I don't even know if it's a voicing or if he's just kind of hitting the piano percussively down low. So lots of this driving quarter note in the comping. So it's really kind of pushing ahead with the bass and the drums. So it's atypical for jazz comping. Uh, you know, if we heard McCoy Tyner or, or Oscar Peterson or something, it would be a different kind of comping. Listen to his left hand. So he's playing all these off beats, but this like, just like this weird rumbling, he's just kind of hitting the piano down there. It's so low that if it's a voicing, we can't quite tell. Now, he's a seasoned piano player. He knows that a voicing that low does not carry. He knows he should move it up at least a sixth, maybe an octave. He wants that effect. Lots of motivic moments. Oh. So he quoted Sonny Rollins' St. Thomas right there. So just three short solos. The melody, one chorus of trumpet, one chorus of tenor, one chorus of piano. So now did you notice when we came to the melody how it geared down? And we have this nice bouncy feeling again, right? So what that was is uh, Roy Brooks on drums went off the cymbal to the hi-hat and started playing a two feel. Same thing, Gene Taylor quit walking the bass and went back to this two feel. Listen to the bass and the drums and the piano 
in how they connect to the melody. So nothing up to that point, but there's some rhythmic hits here, right there, and here. Here. Yeah, pretty cool. And uh, absolutely Horace-like in so many ways. So there wasn't a set comping rhythm that he was using, which on many of his songs there is. Um, but there was a, that idiosyncratic, you know, how low he was playing. I don't know what that was about. Um, maybe that, you know, where he would normally comp, the piano was out of tune. Like, I, I don't know, but... It, it was, it, it was a thing. He was doing a lot. He was doing it behind the trumpet solo, behind the tenor solo. He did it behind his own solo. So pretty cool. He was comping in a way that was also driving, really connecting with the quarter notes a lot, the quarter notes of the drums and the bass, yet um, didn't, uh, it didn't get in the way. We could imagine that being sort of too much in many ways. If I were in a group or coaching an ensemble, where the piano player were playing like that. There's, there would be about 150 ways to get it wrong and about one way to get it right. And <laughs> Horace had the way to get it right. So, uh, so many ways to comp. And I made that point, like McCoy wouldn't be playing like this. Uh, Oscar Peterson would not be playing like this. And all that means is that these people had such a personal way of not only soloing, but comping that we can tell who's who. So the cool thing is if you listen to enough of these guided listenings, you're going to get a sense like, man, drop, you know, one of the drop the needle things. I don't know who the piano player is, but I know it's not McCoy Tyner. Okay, well, I know it's not Red Garland because from Red, I'd expect this. Hmm. And, you know, so it's like you're in Downbeat Magazine on the last page getting to do your listening test. And that's what those guys are doing. They, they've recognized uh, the personal signature of some of these folks. Uh, I know drummers who can tell who the drummer is because it's like, oh, yeah, his drums are tuned really high. It's so-and-so. Or the cymbal, the sound of the cymbal. Yes, that's absolutely the kind of cymbal so-and-so would use. Or Billy Higgins' ride pattern has this, you know, this kind of thing to it. Or Elvin Jones subdivides this way where Philly Joe subdivides that way. Um, very cool, right? So, you know, we, we're just fans of the music, but after a while, we get to know who we're listening to. Uh, so hopefully these guided listenings are good. They help you kind of listen in. Um, and so I'm going to, I guarantee they had rehearsals for this. And, you know, was it maybe they just, you know, kind of did it a half an hour before the recording? Maybe, but, um, but they were really well rehearsed. There was nobody missed anything especially in the last four or five of the song where there's these rhythmic hits together, the entire band, like they were on it, man. So, um, you know, and Horace was known for having set bands. It, it wasn't just a bunch of guys getting together for a recording session. This was his band. Uh, so we really hear that in uh, in the recording. So I'm, I know this album, I've had it, I've had it on vinyl for decades and decades, but I'm excited to go back and listen to it because there's a lot of music on here I just really don't remember and I'm excited about checking out. Love Junior Cook and like super love Blue Mitchell on the trumpet. So uh, hopefully if this is an introduction to this album, have fun digging into it like I'm going to be doing. And uh, as I said, if you're in upstate New York, if you're in Minneapolis, if you're in Western Canada, some opportunities for us to connect uh, over the next few months. And of course, be checking out jazzwiresummit.com. And uh, I would love to get you signed up and working for us. These events are built for adult musicians, semi-pros, amateurs, folks playing on the side. But we do have scholarships for the Jazzwire Summer Summit in July. So if that's you or if you know someone 16 to 21 who wants to come have this experience with us, please, please, please get them in contact with us. Go to the website, hit the contact page. We'll go from there. All right, everybody. Take care. <laughs>